Well, hello there, Richard Tubb here, coming to you live and in color from the Acronis CyberFit Summit 2022 in Miami Beach. Now, we're broadcasting live from the Acronis Cyber Studio, right in the heart of the CyberFit Summit area, where 1,500 plus of the world's top managed service businesses, IT, and cybersecurity professionals have come together for two days of learning and networking. Now, given the current climate, cyber protection is high on the list of most MSP's agendas, so I'm excited to be joined today by James Slaby. Hey, how are you doing today, James? I'm doing great, Richard. My voice is uh, still holding up. Uh, I've been hosting a, a, one of the breakout tracks here, the Winning Through Innovation track, uh, and so my voice has gotten a workout. I sat on a panel yesterday. I'm uh, hosting a CISO panel uh, later this afternoon, so uh, I'm, I'm going to be... Um, Drinking a lot of uh, uh, hot water and lemon and honey, I think, uh, they after are, this is all They over. are working you hard yeah, here at yeah. this one, aren't it's they? Good. You're it's all good, though. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so your role in the um, Acronis business, you're the uh, Director of Cyber Protection and Solutions Marketing at Acronis. Tell us what that role entails. That's right. Um, it's a kind of a mix of uh, marketing asset creation. You know, I'll, I'll write the odd case study or blog post, but really a lot of my role is uh, outward-facing. So I'm doing 40 or 50 webinars uh, a year on various subjects, uh, mainly for our uh, MSP partners and prospects. Uh, I'm doing more live events, getting back out on the road. Yeah. I did a week in Dubai. Um, I did the Exchange Conference in Denver recently. That's a lot of uh, onstage uh, speaking, presenting, panel moderating, panel sitting. I've got a, a strategic aspect of the job, too. Uh, my boss has me looking at uh, adjacent markets that we might potentially expand into. So that's the kind of the solutions part of the solutions marketing role. Yeah. You are one of the hardest working men in the channel. Oh, <laughs> yeah, probably. No, I doubt, I doubt that. I, you, you've been very they, kind they, to me when we've done webinars and things of that nature before. You're a very gracious host, so you, thank you for that. You're, you're a tremendous asset, too. Uh, you bring such a great audience uh, with you anytime uh, you're uh, hosting or guesting at one of our webinars. So we yeah. appreciate you, too. Well, this is a unique environment here. Um, obviously, podcast audio only, but to give our listeners uh, a little insight into where we are and what's actually happening, obviously, I said we're at a Cronus CyberFit Summit. It is a bustling atmosphere. We're both very busy, but we're actually in a custom-built studio, and it's a bit like a, uh, a goldfish bowl, isn't it, in the center of the conference, and as we are recording now, people are walking past and waving and saying hello to us through the glass. It's a unique environment, and I'm loving it. It's a, it's a very cool studio setup. I'm sure there are people wandering by going like, who's that fellow sitting with Richard Tubb? Um, <laughs> so, but no, it's, it's great, and we've had a whole series of uh, MSP luminaries uh, like yourself taking advantage of it to uh, record segments for their own podcasts and I, so forth. Yeah, I so it's love great. it. It's a really good idea. Love it. I would love, actually, just as a, you know, an on-air thought, uh, to get all of those podcasts together and sort of um, uh, pull together like a, a cumulative uh, uh, podcast of all the different episodes, if there's any way to tag that. I'm just saying that out That's on a really air cool now. idea. Yeah. And if nothing else, we should get a group shot. You know, yes. Like a, all, the, all this MSB brain power in the room in one place. Yeah. Anyway, down to business. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about your role of director as cyber, cyber protection marketing at Acronis. Let's clarify some of the terminology here. So Acronis have coined this term cyber protection. I love it. I know what it means, but Explain to the listeners, what is cyber protection? Because most companies talk about cyber security. Um, it's a pretty simple concept, really. It's the combination integration of data protection. So think classic backup and disaster recovery with cyber security. So there's a, obviously a, a bunch of advantages for that combination for a typical MSP partner. They've got a single agent on the endpoint managing a whole uh, range of uh, services on the cybersecurity and the data protection side. It's integrated back at the console. It consolidates the licensing. But the, the really cool part about it, from my perspective, is the kind of um, uh, mutual leverage that you get when you combine cybersecurity and data protection. So, for instance, the ability to scan backups that you stored in the cloud for vulnerabilities and malware so that when you're doing a restoral uh, in the event of a data loss or 
you know, CEO needs to get a new email, what you're sure that what you're restoring is clean and not introducing uh, any uh, any vulnerabilities that you should have patched. Yeah, and this is why I'm such a fan of the the phrase cyber protection because if we take cybersecurity in isolation. You know, um, it, it's not just about protection. It's about looking after the backups. It's about education. And so I like how Acronis are moving the conversation forward here and saying, look, it's not just about one tool. You know, this is multifaceted and there's lots of things going on to keep uh, clients protected. Yeah, the platform play also has some nice um, advantages when you, you're trying to get hooks into things like your PSA and your RMM. Uh, you know, from a reporting and management standpoint, the, uh, anywhere that you can consolidate there makes your staffs more efficient, easier to train, onboard, etc. Yeah. So, uh, Acronis, you work with thousands of MSPs globally every year, IT solution providers, VARs. Can you give me some examples of where you're seeing IT companies uh, leaving themselves and their clients exposed to cyber threats? Oh, there's nothing easier. You just uh, open a bleeping computer every morning, and there's another uh, another attack. I uh, I decided to look for some fresh examples this morning, and uh, we saw Maple Leaf Foods, which is the big Canadian pork and beef processor. Uh, there's Kearney <clears throat> and Company, uh, that uh, the big accounting firm to the public sector, uh, uh, hit by Lockbit. Uh, Continental, the big German auto parts firm. Uh, also purportedly hit by Lockbit. Uh, it, it's uh, Modi Bank, um, the Australian health insurer, has apparently been breached in a double extortion attack with almost 10 million uh, patient records exposed. Uh, so the cyber criminals are really doing uh, the marketing work for us by keeping uh, successful attacks in the news on a kind of a daily basis. The caution that I would put there uh, for our partners is that your prospects, your clients can mistakenly believe like, oh, they only go after Global 2000 companies. Nobody wants my data. And the fact is that 75% of attacks, uh, less successful ransomware attacks are prosecuted against small and medium businesses. Your clients are the ones getting hit. So don't let them think that just because the only ones that they read about uh, in the journal and the Times are these uh, global uh, brand names. Uh, the U.S. Department of Justice is fully three quarters of their victims are actually uh, smaller businesses. Like that's, you know, your data may not be valuable to anyone else, but the, it's valuable to you. Yes. And so locking it up or threatening to leak it is something you're uh, likely to want to pay money to make not make go away. I was having a conversation with some of the experts and you, you pulled together so many wonderful people from the industry, so many talented people in one place. So, you know, I'll say up front, if you've never, if you're listening to this and never attended a Cronus Cyber Fit Summit, make sure it's in your diary for next year, genuinely, because it is a, a, just turning into a beast of event with the best in the industry. But anyway, I was speaking to some of the cybersecurity experts and we were talking about this topic, uh, saying where clients um, you know, when we share stories with them that make the front page of the New York, you know, the Post or the Guardian or whatever it might be, they inevitably look at it and the figures, the ransomware figures are so big, the damage is so vast that it's a bit incomprehensible for them as small businesses. They say, that's not going to happen to me. So the advice that, that I've been giving to MSPs is look for examples local to you of small businesses. It's, it's a lot more difficult to find because people tend to keep these things under wraps. Yeah, if nobody you can, wants to disclose that they've Nobody wants to disclose it. But if yeah. you can find a story, say, of a local business like your clients who's been hit and say there's 5,000, 10,000, 15, 25,000 pounds worth of, or dollars worth of damage... That becomes much more uh, understandable, doesn't it, for small businesses? And criminals are are, are clever, right? They're they're not going to present you with a million dollar ransom that you know they know that you will never be able to pay. Uh, and in fact, they're often open to negotiation. Say so like, "Well, I can't really afford sixty thousand. Can can you do forty thousand? And they're, they're very reasonable. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I, they're they're like any other. Uh, global SaaS business, uh, just, you know, with the dubious ethics, right? And um, uh, But uh, the scale, the, the distribution model looks an awful lot like Salesforce.com. Uh, they have 24-7 chat lines to help you out. You know, they'll connect you with the financial networks they need for you to, you need to, you know, source Bitcoin or whatever. They're very, very helpful when it comes to you paying for their services. So, yeah. 
So we talked a bit about cybersecurity. Let's talk about the protection part, the cyber protection here. So we're here in the USA, uh, where disaster recovery is something that is a necessity due to extreme weather and other factors. In fact, we're sitting here with our sort of fingers crossed at the moment, aren't we, James? Because um, Hurricane Nicole, or at least Storm Nicole, is uh, coming into the Miami and the Florida area. And we're like, oh, you know, we hope everybody can get out and be uh, safe. Yeah, I speak to businesses in other parts of the world, specifically the UK, Europe, they don't think disaster recovery is important to them because they're not going to be hit by a tornado. We don't, you know, we don't have those sort of things in the UK. Can you explain to MSPs listening though why disaster recovery is essential for all businesses? We're not just talking about natural disasters here, are we? Yeah, the existential threats to small businesses these days surely still include natural disasters if you're in a tornado alley or a hurricane zone. Uh, but you're as likely to have your business brought down by uh, a malware attack uh, as a, a weather event or a fire or flood, a, uh, a human error that, uh, that are often uh, behind these kind of things. So if you're taking a clear-eyed look uh, at managing your risk, you should be prioritizing cybersecurity attacks, and uh, DR is increasingly should be part of your risk management plan. I think the other thing that's going to end up pushing a lot of businesses to really seriously consider DR services is cyber insurance. Mm. Um, insurer, insurers were kind of making money in cyber insurance for a long time, but the rise of ransomware has made it an unprofitable business for them. So they're raising premiums and they're raising insurability standards. They say, yeah, well, you, you better start implementing things like multi-factor authentication and we want to see what your anti-malware strategy is like or we won't issue you a policy and increasingly, having a DR plan, DR technology, or DR service in place is going to be table stakes for getting cyber insurance. I, I think that's, that's kind of a game changer. The good news is that cloud DR services uh, put disaster recovery within the reach of small and medium businesses that would have, you know, if they, their only alternative was rolling their own, uh, they could never afford it. It'd be too complicated. But... Uh, something that uh, so that's a service that an uh, MSP can uh, deliver to them in a way that's uh, affordable and relieves them of all the complexity of it. Yeah, and on the subject of cyber insurance, you know, I had the opportunity to sit down with a luminary, uh, Eric Simpson, who's one of the architects of the managed service industry, uh, and I'd encourage listeners seek out that episode as well. Uh, Eric and I were talking about cyber security insurance because many MSPs just think, well, no, I've got the tools in place, I've got the knowledge. You know, we don't need to recommend cyber insurance to clients. I think that's a short-sighted move, isn't it? Because you can, you know, think about insurance for your car, for instance. You know, um, you might think, oh, yeah, I can pay for any repairs. But what about the repairs to the third party? There's so many things to consider here. So cyber insurance, I think, is something that MSP should be seriously considering for themselves and building relationships with brokers for their clients. Yeah, it's a slightly different flavor for MSPs. It's going to be the uh, kind of tech errors and omissions side of it. It's kind sure. of like cyber liability insurance Indeed. more than cyber insurance. But that's re increasingly a good idea because cyber insurers, when a business gets hit, are going to say like, well, who are your tech providers? Maybe they're partly at fault and we can go after them and get them to pay some of this claim on your behalf. Exactly uh, the same for the same reason you carry liability insurance on your car in case... Uh, you're in a crash with someone and their insurance company decides to come after you, that protects you there. It's the, it's the exact same thing going absolutely. on Absolutely, yeah. I picked up on an article you wrote recently, which I thought was absolutely excellent. Um, uh, you wrote it for Channel Futures, a guest post, where you suggested in the article that MSPs should fire clients that won't invest in cyber protection services. So a little bit, uh, I'm not gonna say controversial, but inflammatory there. I totally agree with you, but can you explain the thinking behind that article? Yeah, I'm all about the clickbait headlines, you know. <laughs> I, no, no, that's a legit, um, uh, a legit sediment. And the fact of the matter is that if your client won't invest in your most basic level of cyber protection, it's much likelier that they're gonna turn into this time sink that you've got to deal with uh, cleaning up their messes because uh, you know they haven't gotten your you know good AI enabled anti malware and you know vulnerability scanning and these kind of things. So they're wide open. That's really not fair to your other clients um, who are paying, who are uh, better protected, who therefore t require less of your time. Uh, you know, 
it's that twenty um, that eighty twenty rule in effect of that you're. So if you can uh, push those clients out, you're really in a much better chance to manage the risk of the clients that are uh, doing the right thing and uh, at least investing in a basic level of cybersecurity. The other thing to consider is that clients like that expose you and your other clients to increased cyber risk. You think about tech supply chain attacks. Uh, this is something that uh, I've written about quite a bit. And um, uh, so, yeah, they're, they're really not worth the, the pain and they're, they're certainly not profitable uh, over the long term. But really, if you, you think about trying to reduce your overall risk profile for your entire client base, uh, those, those people really should, uh, you really should consider saying, you, you can join up at this level or I, 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 can't, I, I can't take you on as a client. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a difficult conversation for, for MSPs to have, but I think it's an essential one. Yeah, awkward but I, necessary. Yeah, I, being a former MSP and myself, I can, you know, and I think most people who run MSP businesses who are listening to this will, um, you know, empathize with the situation where they, they have sleepless nights because their clients are not taking the advice you know, and uh, again, luminaries like Eric Simpson and Carl Palachuk, you know, I've, I've said this, you can't care more about your client's network than they do. Yep. So I absolutely agree with you on that article. You know, if they're, if they're not paying attention to the advice, they're not invested in the cybersecurity, it's a house of cards waiting to come down. And you don't really want to be associated yeah, with absolutely. that when it happens absolutely. as well. Absolutely. We will include a link to that excellent Channel Futures uh, article in the show notes for this. So thank you for sharing that with us. But let's get into the nuts and bolts a little bit here, mm -hmm. uh, James. Ransomware. So that's something every MSP has to protect their clients against. You know, a ransomware breach for a client is not only financially damaging, but as we've explored a little bit here, it's reputationally disastrous for an MSP as well. So what techniques can MSPs use to deflect and mitigate ransomware attacks? Well, I think uh, you as a, you have to take a, apply a little more scrutiny to your technology providers, your vendors. And so, for example, uh, your software vendors, you need to uh, scrutinize to make sure that they are doing everything that they need to do to protect themselves. You want to look at their development process, make sure that they're doing obscure software development. And there's similar uh, kind of a assessment that you should do uh, with all of your tech vendors. You know, we think about the uh, that big uh, popular IT operations tool vendor that got breached a couple of years ago. Right. And how that, uh, you know, 100,000 of their customers downloaded that malware and 10,000 of them actually found it activated and uh, stealing their data. And, uh, of course, that's a giant reputational hit. You know, you're supposed to be a trusted technology provider and you end up as a conduit for malware. Uh, I actually wrote a piece about this in the wake of that attack. Uh, it's called uh, Assessing uh, Software Supply Chain Cybersecurity Risk. It's an ebook on in the Acronis Resource Center that you can download. Okay, we we'll, we'll include that in the show notes. We won't as even well. ask you for a, 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 an email address to, to get that one. But I, uh, it's a kind of an evaluation framework, a set of questions that you can uh, ask your vendors. It's also a useful tool, I think, to show your clients is like, look, this is what we are doing to ensure that we're not a link um, in a supply chain attack on you. Yeah, is that we've taken steps to protect you against that kind of thing. So let me put you on the spot here. If an MSP's client suffers a ransomware breach, what would your advice to them in to, to them be in terms of paying the exploitation, uh, you know, the uh, paying the fee essentially? Would you recommend that they do that or not? Uh, I used to be more dogmatic about this, taking the sort of law enforcement line. There's like, oh, well, you should never pay. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you're just encouraging the criminals and, you know, for the good of society, we all need to kind of, you know, not negotiate with terrorists. Yeah. But if it's your own business at stake, I, I, I would have a hard time advising someone against that. You've got to take a look at what your potential downtime is, what that costs to you, what it costs to your, uh, your clients. Uh, take If you're a public company, you've got shareholders to think about, you might be subject to a regulatory regime where, you're, where compliance sanctions might be in the offing. Um, so I would say 
that's a that's an individual kind of business decision, and I don't think it's helpful to be dogmatic, absolutist about saying absolutely never pay. Paying might be uh, uh, the the more sensible business decision. Obviously, we're going to advocate for like uh, deploying technology that will protect you from ever facing that dilemma in the first place. Yeah, good good answer. I like that and. You know, we talked about cyber uh, protection insurance, cybersecurity insurance earlier on. Um, I've heard stories come across some, you know, uh, businesses where the uh, the extortion fee has been paid by the insurer. Yeah, in many you know, cases, uh, they're they're exfiltrating data before they trigger the encryption attack. That's the so-called double extortion attack. They've got access. They know exactly how much you're covered for. Yeah. And so it's like, like oh, I see that your uh, cyber insurance policy will pay $50,000. That's what we're going to charge you for a ransom because we know you can afford that. Yeah. Um, so. Interesting. Interesting uh, question. Thank you for letting me put you on the spot there. Yeah, by all <laughs> Doesn't affect our friendship, I hope. No, no, not at all. <laughs> I, 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 like I say, uh, God forbid that you have to face that sort of decision, yeah. but I wouldn't, you know... Uh, you got to look after. It's like doing the right thing for society, and then going out of business isn't really a net plus yeah. in my book. So we've talked about cyber protection. We've talked about the tools. We've talked about insurance. Let's look a little bit deeper on cybersecurity. Of course, well, you know your, your protection is only really as strong as the human beings yes. using it. In fact, you might argue this is the weakest link of the chain. No technology can truly eliminate human error. So, James, talk to us about cyber security awareness training for MSPs, their clients. How can it help raise awareness? Well, first of all, I, I kind of want to say that it feels a little lazy to me when we who are cybersecurity professionals say, damn the users, if it weren't for them, you know, our life would be so much easier. Oh, yeah. And the fact of the matter is your colleagues there are just trying to do their jobs. You know, I get back from a 15-hour flight from the Jitech show in Dubai, and I've got a thousand emails and Slack messages and texts and social media messages to process before I fall asleep. Forgive me if my cybersecurity antenna aren't up all the way. Um, so, but that said, cyber you know, security awareness training is a really worthwhile discipline to practice. A gentle reminder to people that. Uh, um, phishing emails are getting more devious and convincing all the time and they, they, they need to be wary. You just want to make sure you do it in a way that keeps them as your allies in the, the fight against cybersecurity. You know, don't punish them or shame them when they fail your, you know, your phishing simulation test. The other dimension of that I would add to it is make sure you include your executives. I know it's uh, difficult to uh, you know, urge the boss, the big boss, to kind of, you know, make sure you're, you're, you're taking that test or, oh, by the way, you failed that, tisk tisk. Um, you know, that, that, that's an awkward conversation. But it's important because increasingly those are the folks that are being targeted. If, uh, you, if you successfully fish the executive, he, he or she is the one that has the power to move funds. Uh, and if you successfully impersonate them, then underlings are more likely to respond to that that missive from the CEO that says, you know, send me uh, send me everyone's tax ID number overnight. I really need it now at three in the morning uh, on the other side of the world for some reason. Um, but it was like, well, boss says it, hop to it. Yeah. So uh, so so don't uh, don't ignore your senior staff when you're doing that. It's been my experience actually, and I almost got caught out that. The cybersecurity, uh, sorry, cyber criminals, they prey on what you said earlier on, which is uh, your need for speed <laughs> to move through things really, really quickly. They prey on the fact that you're going to glance at an email and try and deal with it as quickly as possible, which all of us are guilty of doing, trying to nuke all, you know, thousands of oh, emails. absolutely. And That's like a that. zero inbox technique. It's like yeah. if, you can, if you can handle it in under 30 seconds, do it now. Exactly. Yeah. David Allen, if you can do it in two minutes or less, do yep. it there. Like, you know, I'm a big GTD fan. I almost got caught out recently because yep. I was rushing through uh, something and then I paused 
And, you know, it's some of the messages that come through, some of the phishing messages are so good now that I don't think, you know, you, you could really take a look and go, hmm, you know, there's no bad spelling in there. It's, you know, there's very little mistakes. So yeah, somebody figured out who my alma mater was and sent me a very convincing thing looking like it was from my alumni association. I yeah. nearly bit on that. Yes, which uh, how embarrassed, well, not just embarrassing, disastrous for us. So slow down a little bit and think about what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, anytime you say when something is like, very, very urgent, uh, you know, make sure that, you know, give it a closer sniff. Yeah. I guess there's some advice in there. Nothing to do with cybersecurity, but it does lean over onto it. You know, if you're going to reply to an email really quickly, just pause. You and I have both yeah, done yeah, it where somebody said something to us and you, yeah. you're going to reply really quickly, take a breath and yeah. see if it's still there in sort of five, ten minutes. Yeah. That. So, uh, yeah. Now... We live in a world of cloud computing. Of course we do. Nearly every MSP uses a cloud solution from the big three, Microsoft, Google, or Amazon. You know, we've got, even got alternative cloud providers such as Linode. Uh, they're here at the event. There's a worrying trend that I'm noticing. I don't know if you spotted this as well. Some clients and their MSPs seem to almost abdicate responsibility for cyber protection because they feel as though their cloud vendor is just going to look after everything for them. What are your thoughts on cyber protection for cloud services? Oh, yeah. This is a subject I've done a series of webinars on. I've got another one uh, upcoming in the next couple of weeks. And the fact is that Google, Microsoft, Amazon, other their competitors do a pretty good job of protecting their own infrastructure, but not so much protecting your data. Uh, and if you look at uh, the scrutinize the kind of contracts SLAs there, the, the terms there in terms of what they're able to, what they're willing uh, to commit to restoring are pretty feeble and almost certainly wouldn't meet your own uh, RPO, RTO ob objectives. Um, so what that means is you, you have to really take the data protection piece of it into your own hands. It's possible to contractually get stronger protections from them, but I, frankly, I think it's much better if uh, that, that's not their business, and it's something that you can do very effectively. It's actually an opportunity for MSPs to go to their clients and say, "Look, if you're uh, if you're using Azure or uh, AWS or whatever, let, let's have a look at how well your data is protected there. I, I think you're going to find that it's not as good as you thought it was, and not acceptable to your by your own yeah. uh, kind of business uh, continuity data continuity standards. You know, again, there may be Compliance issues, you know, data retention kind of things that you're you're missing if you uh, go to those defaults. Uh, so again, we're not knocking them, uh, but that's just not their business. And uh, so don't make the mistake, which I think is a common one. I agree with you that uh, uh, you're thinking you've got you've got protections that you you really. You don't have. Yeah. Let's talk about some of these specific Acronis products in your portfolio then. So, for instance, for uh, for cloud protection of that nature, is there something in the Acronis portfolio that helps with that? Sure. For example, uh, we do data protection for uh, all the major cloud productivity suites, so Microsoft 365 uh, G Suite. Um, very easy to uh, uh, protect those mailboxes. It also gives you some nice features that you would never get uh, with a typical uh, cloud-provided uh, data protection agreement, like the ability to restore an individual email or an individual SharePoint repository as opposed to doing an entire backup because someone needs a, an email that they deleted, uh, you know, three months ago. Yeah, I think it was Patrick that I was speaking to, and he was saying that uh, a new feature that you rolled out as well for, like, OneNote, where you can restore individual uh, yep. OneNote. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah, very but Basically, cool. it's a very granular uh, restoral of all those different resources uh, yep. that... Um, uh, that are involved in those uh, uh, those cloud suites. Yeah, and you can do restore of emails as uh, PST files, even if you don't use Outlook or whatever, just to make the data more sort of... Uh, you really are up on the new features in oh, the product, man. I'm, That's impressive. <laughs> I'm, I'm an uber geek when it comes to this sort of stuff, so I'm liking it a lot. So I want to pick up on something that you mentioned uh, in that uh, last sort of sentence, and about, oh, it's easy to deploy. Now, I've been recording some videos while I've been here with Acronis clients from all over the world. I've spoken to people from Australia, from Serbia, from the UK, from North America, from Poland, ev you know, everywhere. Acronis has got such a global reach. 
It's been really refreshing for me to speak to different MSPs, different parts of the world, and hear what their challenges are. But I'm going to tell you, and, and again, I'm not trying to give you a big head here or a cronus, but... Well, I, since I created all the products, I think I deserve some Yeah, since you're the there. sole developer exactly. of everything exactly. there, yeah. The word easy comes out again and again and again, like everybody mentioned it. So when I was saying to them, well, what's it like to deploy and use? And they're like, oh, it's easy. Everybody has said that. So tell me about that, you know, the, the, the philosophy that goes behind this, because cybersecurity, most people think of it as highly complex. And of course, there's lots of moving parts, lots of things going on. But Acronis seemed to have really built this culture of, okay, maybe highly complex behind the scenes, but we're going to make it super, super easy to deploy. And yes, use. it's the paddling duck model. It's like we're on the surface, we are gliding, and underneath, it's uh, pedaling furiously. Well, you know, it's just a simple, you want to win the loyalty and affection of your MSP partners. You do everything to make their business profitable, right? Um, uh, so I think of a feature like automatic adding of new resources to um, uh, cyber protection plans. So that when something, you're not, you're not having to go manually and it's going to automatically add it to a default plan for that category of device or that geographic location or that department. And uh, so anything you can do to, you know, apply automation to it, you know, AI is increasingly playing a big role, you know, automatically detecting ransomware attacks. Uh, the terminating them and then unwinding any files that they encrypted before our smoke alarm went off so that the only the client is never aware of it and the only way the provider might mention it is they're you know scrubbing through their logs and go like oh I'm protected an attack so we've tried to make that easier to uh, get a report on activity so that you can go to your client and say this is all the things that all the attacks that we stopped this is all the protections that we provided um, you know, you think of a tool like the CyberFit score, which is effectively um, a lightweight vulnerability assessment and something you can take to your client and say, here's all these areas that we could address to uh, improve your overall risk profile. Um, and I, I already talked about the kind of the integration in the agent, integration in the console. Uh, I think everyone understands that the lower your footprint on the end device, uh, the better it is for everybody. But just the ability to very simply, you know, hit a switch and all right, okay, now we've added vulnerability scanning to this device or this class of devices or this location, or here we've added automated patch management, here we're adding EDR, here we're adding DLP, to have that all in kind of one product, one agent, one console, there's obvious leverage and uh, operational efficiency that you bring to it. And it's just, it gives you a nice upgrade path, uh, lots of our client, um, our partners start clients on, we'll do backup and endpoint anti-malware with the uh, anti-ransomware capability into it. And the, the once they're happy with that, say like, oh, we have all these other services that we uh, uh, we can add, uh, you know, the cross-sell, upsell opportunities are uh, an easy sell and e easier to activate. Yeah. Let me ask you a question with your marketing uh, hat on here. So lots of MSPs listening to this, they're going to be intrigued. They're going to be, oh, okay, I want to look into, you know, the, uh, the Acronis portfolio. See, you know, it sounds easy. It sounds powerful. Sounds good. They have a challenge, though, when they speak to either new clients or, uh, in many cases, existing clients. And the clients will say to them, we don't want to pay extra for that. Um, or existing clients will say, well, we thought, James, you looked after that for yes. us already. Yes. So I can see you smiling, like you know where I'm going with this. With your marketing hat on, what advice would you give to MSPs about in encouraging their clients to realize that this isn't one and done, it's not done and finished? You know, this is a, cybersecurity is a moving target. Yeah, I, um, uh, that is a kind of a, 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 the big sales challenge, right, is educating clients that the Cyber criminals aren't resting, right? That uh, rust never sleeps, right? And it was something that uh, Tony Wilson of ConnectWise talked about in his keynote here earlier that you've got to uh, disabuse yourself of the notion that you will ever eliminate every single point of failure in your overall uh, risk management project. Um, so, uh, it, 
it's a kind of a constant refresh reminding them of what's going on in the headlines. There are marketing tools that you can take advantage from a Cronus, uh, you know, okay. put on your own webinar. You, know, you go to our partner portal and it's just loaded with uh, uh, marketing assets, ebooks, case studies, webinar materials, pre recorded webinars, email campaigns in a box that you can put together. And those kind of things uh, allow you to provide a kind of a constant reminder to your client that there are uh, the, the, the cyber threat environment out there is kind of constantly evolving. Um, that there's a good chance that you, you look at research, for example, that shows that the typical small business struggles to patch known vulnerabilities. So never mind the 10,000 new iterations of ransomware that are coming out every minute, kind of auto-generated by uh, these AI bots. But um, vulnerabilities that your vendor has told you about and provided you a patch, and you just uh, it's a treadmill that you're not keeping up with. Uh, so uh, never mind these new zero-day threats that are, that are coming at you. This is stuff that you know about and you should be able to address. But it, it, it's tough to keep up with. You know, you're, you're getting uh, patches from your OS vendors and your application vendors and your network, you know, your router vendors. It's, it, it, and some of them you need to test against your existing applications so you, you're not breaking something with an update or losing functionality from it. So you got to, uh, you know, pity the small business person that's got to try to manage that. But that, that's clearly an opportunity for MSPs as well. Yeah. But I would keep um, I, I I would keep that conversation going with uh, with some of these tools and uh, make sure they're aware that, uh, that that they can't stand pat. Yeah, I want to share an observation with you. If I rewind, sort of even five years, Acronis was known by many in the industry, but it uh, it was far from a household name. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and speaking to many MSPs as I have at the CyberFit Summit here in Miami, uh, I've said, you know, how does, when you go to your clients and speak about Acronis, is it, you know, something that they recognize? Oh, yeah, they say now. So the, you know, the uh, household recognizability of Acronis has gone up. Uh, and a story I'll share with you, you know, my um, stepson, uh, Ben, is into Formula One. Oh, yes. And he came to me the other day and he was like, Acronis, you do, you do work with Acronis, don't you? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, oh yeah, I spotted them on the Formula One. <laughs> so this whole whole piece that you've done around uh, you know the sports teams and and things of that nature, that seems to have really raised the profile of the business. Let, 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 let me tell you, Richard, when we first started doing this about six years ago, I was highly skeptical. Mm. I was like, this looks like a lifestyle play for our executives so that they can get like trackside seats. <laughs> That's a very and polite was, way of putting I it. I was yeah. looking at the, the, the budget that was going into it. I think, oh, with all the programs I could do with that. Um, and six years later, I'm like, wow, what a short sighted dope I was. That's why I'm an individual contributor and not, you know, uh, sitting on Mahogany Row there um, because it really has uh, greatly increased our kind of overall brand awareness but we've kind of taken it um a, another step that is even cooler in my book i mean i'm i live in boston i'm a fan of the local baseball team i was very proud to see the acronis logo in the park but really we're just we're an ingredient right mm. we're under the hood and so what we we created this team up program which gets our partners our MSP partners delivering services to someone like the Red Sox. So we've got a MSP called Green Pages. Uh, I think they're pretty well known, and they are actually delivering uh, uh, data protection and cybersecurity services to the Red Sox. And it's their logo in the ballpark now. So it's great that the Acronis brand is out there, but it's much better for our partners to have their brand affiliated with these pro sports organizations, whether it's F1 or. Major League Baseball, Premier League Soccer, FIFA, the, uh, excuse me, pr Premier League Football. Um, and, and, you know, we've got 60 plus of these uh, organizations uh, around the world and, you know, a dozen different uh, professional sports. And that is a unique opportunity for, uh, for many of these partners and, and they're loving it. I was just, I'm, I'm working on a case study of the Green Pages story. It's a cool technical story. But they also talk about how what a brand boost that it's been for them, how it's brought 
business to their attention because somebody who had no idea who Green Pages was saw their logo at the Sox game and looked into it. And uh, it's a rare opportunity for MSPs to be affiliated with that kind of without a Cronus bringing it to them, it's probably not something they could put together on their own. Agreed, and I've spoke to... Well, first of all, what's the program called? Oh, it's called Acronis CyberFit Sports Team-Up. CyberFit Fit but, Sports Team-Up. Yeah. So any Acronis partners who are listening to this podcast, if you have overlooked this program before, I would highly encourage you to go and check it out because I have spoken to a number of MSPs. I was very fortunate um, uh, to spend time with your team in Schaffhausen in Switzerland uh, last year and to meet lots of European MSPs. And the MSPs who have got involved in this program and are sponsoring local sports teams or getting involved in the, uh, the IT there, they said exactly that, that they would never have dreamed that they could be hitting at that level, to use a sports analogy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to get involved with those teams. But Acronis make that possible through the partnership, don't they? So, yeah, where can people go to find out more about that program? So uh, there's a... Uh there's plenty of uh, information on our website. You also reach out directly to Ryan Davis uh, at acronis.com. He would be very happy to help you out there. Dan Havens, who's actually on stage uh, as our master of ceremonies for this event, uh, is, is another guy that uh, has a lot of energy on this subject. It really is. It really is very exciting for us. And it's a big differentiator uh, for us against uh, other people that are in the kind of the same business as us. The, it just brings a kind of a cool factor. Mm. But again, it's worth noting that it's it's not a sponsorship, right? You're not just paying to have your logo. Yeah. We're, we're, these sporting organizations are consuming our technology in often very kind of cutting edge ways, but also in sort of traditional ways that uh, uh, an MSP's uh, prospects are going to relate to. It's like, oh, I can get the same anti-ransomware protection that uh, my my favorite uh, american football or hockey or basketball team is using i want some of that yeah very cool program indeed i'm conscious of time you're a busy man you're going to shoot off and do another session in a in a few minutes here yeah i'm hosting one of the breakout tracks and i'm doing a siso uh, moderating a siso panel later today and uh, then i then it's time for um uh, hot water and lemon and honey <laughs> tea before i let you go i want to ask a question now, looking into your cyber protection crystal ball. What would you say, James, are the threats that MSPs should be preparing themselves to defend against in the future? What are the bad guys got next? Yeah, uh, they're, well, they're rabbiting away every single day. It's a very profitable business. Uh, I, um, we put up some scary statistics. I'll, I, I use a more kind of conservative one, which is if that uh, ransomware were a tech company, it'd be one of the 50 largest in the world. Wow. Um, but the, it, it's just going to get bigger. Um, more insidious uh, extortion techniques. So, you know, nowadays they're exfiltrating data first before they trigger the extortion attack. But now we're seeing things like, not only will we threaten to leak your data, we're calling your customers and telling them that we've got some of their data that was in your control. And if you don't pay the ransom, uh, uh, so, you know, call them up and encourage them. Uh, we've seen another one where they threaten a DDoS attack as well, in addition to those other techniques. Say, uh, you know, pay us or we'll uh, leak your data, we'll embarrass you in front of your customers, and we'll bring down all your web-facing servers uh, while we're at it, too. So that's one thing. Um, number two, you can expect um, uh, greater use of artificial intelligence uh, to kind of automate their attacks. We're already seeing it with a number of uh, zero days of ransomware that are coming out every single day. Um, and But they'll use it to iterate and craft more convincing phishing emails. They're, that That's clearly um, a kind of a new frontier there. Um, uh, you will see um, more living off the land attacks. So this is where they break into your system and take advantage of tools that you use for benevolent pur purposes lying around. So they'll disable your um, security uh -huh. countermeasures. They'll take advantage of your backup tools to move data en masse uh, to a cloud server that they control. They'll use tools that you might have like Mimikatz to, to manage your authentication, authorization environment, steal credentials, escalate privileges, and so forth. Um, that, that's very much becoming a thing. Um, more attacks on cloud infrastructure, cloud storage repositories, containers, uh, 
was we all kind of were pushed to the cloud a little bit more aggressively than we might have done thanks to uh, uh, thanks to the pandemic. But that's um, um, that's uh, uh, exposed some inexperience uh, that we've had in protecting that. So that, that's something worth shoring up. And uh, supply chain attacks are going to continue uh, to be a thing, abuse of those trust relationships. It's a complicated attack to compromise someone's software or data repository, but it's a really high leverage one. You think of the returns that they got on it. And those kind of advanced persistent threat attacks where it's a multi-stage stealthy attack that takes place over a course of months that used to be a nation state on nation state thing. You know, think about the Stuxnet attack, but criminals are employing those techniques now. And uh, so that means you got to think about maybe uh, deploying tools like um, DLP so that you can identify when there are anomalous uh, data flows out of the, the organization. And for the benefit of listeners, DLP? Oh, I'm sorry, da uh, data loss uh, prevention, yeah. which is basically about tracking data movement within your organization and looking for things that are, are suspicious. You know, why is Jim copying the contents of his hard drive to a USB drive uh, right. at midnight? Uh, is he thinking of leaving the company? Um, or why are we making this one terabit transfer of data to this uh, cloud website in, uh, or this target in Asia that we don't normally? Uh, so that's one. EDR would be the other one, um, which is about uh, threat hunting, basically, yep. looking for things that are lurking and uh, uh, identifying what is legitimate, kind of whitelisting your good processes so it's easier to detect uh, malicious ones. All sounds very scary, doesn't it? So let's end on a positive note. <laughs> we talked about well, all what I, they... I don't know. It's, 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 uh, I, I try not to uh, present it as a, a kind of a fear proposition. That's sure. the most tired um, cliche in, in cybersecurity marketing. It's just understand that this is a competing business and what they're competing with is, you know, or what they're after is your uptime. Yes. And it, frankly, being a, a someone who can go in and talk about being a risk management partner, that's a much nicer business model. Uh, it's a much easier conversation than going in and saying like, well, you know, I'm going to do a break fix on your devices and... Um, that kind of transactional sort of model. It's like, no, we're, we're your, your consultants and your partners in this. Um, we need to protect ourselves. We need to protect you. We need to protect our other clients because we're all kind of in this together here. We're in this kind of chain of shared risk increasingly these days. And uh, there's ways to, that we can manage that on your behalf. We can never entirely protect you from it, but we can uh, triage, identify what the biggest threats are. Let's, let's knock those down. And uh, in a way that is obviously makes financial sense for your business. You know, you're effectively amortizing uh, uh, the cost of larger losses over a period of months and uh, effectively preventing them. It's kind of like the insurance story, really. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and that's easier for business people to understand than, uh, you know, taking them through the internals of a ransomware attack. We often demo that. We think that's cool. And uh, for a, t a technologist audience... It's really a, appealing to understand how things are working and what you're kind of up against there. But a business person is like, explain to me what the risk is and how much it's going to cost me to yep. reduce it by X percent. And that's an easy business decision. Yeah. So the cyber criminals are moving fast. They are getting more innovative. You know, uh, a cronus, though. What's next for a cronus to help MSPs to counter this? I've been having conversations with some of the senior execs. I know some of the things that are coming down the uh, the road here, but I don't want to open my mouth and share anything that I shouldn't do. What's next for a cronus? Well, I can tell you about some of the things that we talked about publicly okay. at, at Summit. Uh, we launched our data lo our own data loss prevention capability earlier this year. DLP is not a new technology, but our, we've put a kind of a, an interesting spin on it which is uh, adding AI to it so that it's much easier to uh, manage and maintain. A lot of DLP projects are uh, kind of complicated. You're kind of mapping out traditional data flows and who should have what privilege to move what data where. And because people's roles change, people move in and out of the organization, new applications are added all the time, it becomes this giant pain to manage. And so a lot of companies end up kind of abandoning DL project, DLP projects after a year. Here we've got AI helping um, to automate them, um, 
uh, the initial setup and then the maintenance of that DLP environment over time. And it makes DLP as a service a practical uh, offering for, uh, for MSPs. EDR is something that we just announced uh, that um, uh, will be uh, rolling out early next year. And again, this is about kind of taking on more advanced uh, malware threats that tend to be stealthy and uh, uh, more difficult to detect with traditional, even AI-enabled kind of anti-ransomware uh, uh, approaches. Uh, we've also got an advanced automation capability, which is basically uh, providing more tools to help automate the business side of being an MSP. And uh, we're going to kind of continue to keep expanding the number of blades in the Swiss Army knife that is our, our platform, more cybersecurity kind of capabilities. Uh, uh, you can expect to see more of that down the road. For a company headquartered in Switzerland, that is a very good analogy. For oh, us I never thought of how what a dumb cliche that is that I just <laughs> said there. But yeah, I mean, and that's a, that's kind of an old. But you know, it, it, it's a platform. Yeah. Uh, people understand what that's about, and you just need, you need to always be um, giving. Uh, we always need to be giving our partners new reasons to talk to their clients uh, because there's always new threats coming down the road, and uh, that that will keep them ahead of it. James, I could talk to you all day, but A, I don't think your voice would hold up because yep. you've been doing a lot of talking. And B, you've got to run off and, uh, and, and moderate sessions here. I do. Here. I've got to go get wired up to go on stage here. So. Well, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. I know you're in, uh, you know, a lot of demands, a lot of people wanting your time at this event. So I appreciate oh, yeah, I'm you. I'm super popular at Summit. It's great. <laughs> I appreciate you carving an hour out to sit and talk with me in this beautiful studio here. We've had people walking past, taking photographs, waving to us. It's a great environment. And, and again, for anybody listening who's not aware of a Cronus CyberFit Summit, put it on your calendar for 2023. It is an event. Yeah, you October, back in uh, Miami Beach again next yeah. year. So we've already opened up registration for it. So. There you go. Yeah. Well, we'll put that in the show notes for people to get involved. James, if anybody listening to this wants to continue the conversation with you, how can they reach out to you? Well, I'm currently on Twitter as J.R. Slaby. That's J-R-S-L-A-B-Y. And if it doesn't turn into a cesspool stroke hellscape uh, in the immediate future, I will still be on there, though I'm not super active on it. Uh, easier way to reach out to me is on LinkedIn uh, at James R. Slaby. Again, that's uh, S-L-A-B-Y. And uh, um, I, I keep abreast of that and I often get connections from uh, MSPs and uh, businesses that have seen a webinar or maybe heard me on the famous Richard Tubb podcast and, uh, <laughs> and want to reach out. So thanks so much for having me. It's always a, a great pleasure, My pleasure to talk to you. I'm looking forward to uh, working with you on uh, some webinars and other events like that uh, in the near future. I'll look forward to it. We'll include all of the details, everything that James has mentioned, including his contact details in the show notes. You can go to www.tublog.co.uk for all of the details. James, you're the man. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. It's been such a pleasure to uh, hang out with you for a little bit. Cheers.